uh, giving a keynote every once in a while makes me very, very nervous, especially when I have to speak it in English. Uh, why don't you guys speak Japanese? <laughs> uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ruby 3.0 or Triple S, which I explain later. But uh, first, I really, really appreciate you guys for coming uh, and uh, this nice conferences. Uh, the, I always appreciate the welcomeness and niceness of the community, and uh, this is the most variable property of our Ruby language community. So, so thank you for being nice to each other and being nice to me. <laughs> uh, please stand for the next uh, 45 minutes or so uh, with my bad English. <laughs> anyway, let me talk a little bit about the symbols first. Uh, do you know symbols? Symbols are objects in Ruby language. Uh, goes like this. This is a symbol. Uh, symbol is an object that represents identifiers. So the symbols it is an object to represent some kind of the identifier that uh, appeared in the programs. So it's, it is, they are inherited from Lisp. So the, the, those Lisp programmers, for those Lisp programmers, the symbols are very natural uh, objects. Actually, the, in Lisp, a symbol is one of the atoms in, in Lisp programming language. So when I was in, a, in a school, so I was pretty much uh, influenced by the Lisp programming language. I have never been a Lisp programmer, but uh, I, I studied about the Lisp programming language. I read through the books, and uh, I was pretty much influenced by its design. So when I started designing a programming language named Ruby, so I st stolen, I stole many uh, features and attributes from Lisp programming language. So the the symbol, uh, one of them. So the actually the symbols are one of the biggest Lisp influence in Ruby. And uh, symbols are identifiers. Uh, symbols have the identification numbers inside as an implementation. And uh, in fact, the, in the very, very early stage of uh, Ruby development, uh, symbols are numbers. So the symbol literals are the different uh, the notation of the fixed numbers. So back then, symbol.class returns a fixed num. So it used to be Fixness. But uh, the Lisp is minor, I admit. And uh, so there are so few uh, Lisp or X Lisp users. So the, for those of us, the Lisp influencer uh, symbols are naturally not strings. But uh, I received so many feature requests about the unifying strings and string, uh, uh, strings and symbols. So this is my wonder about uh, those requests. So symbols for me, for for my uh, from my perception. So the symbols uh, strings are so different. So why they want to unify them? But uh, uh, <laughs> symbols are not strings. Uh, strings are not symbols. So I, actually, I didn't understand what they thought about that, that by that kind of the, the feature requests. But uh, okay, let me clear myself, be open mind, <laughs> remove prejudice. And uh, if an object looks like a string and looks like a string, <laughs> it is a string. So, so for those who don't understand Lisp, who don't have any influence from Lisp, so they saw strings as a, some kind of the immutable strings. So 
I opened my mind, so I tried. I tried unifying a string of symbols and failed. <laughs> that introduced a huge incompatibility. So some part of the Ruby community understands Lisp and understands Lisp culture of the uh, uh, symbols as identifiers. And uh, the other part of the uh, Ruby community understand symbols as some kind of the immutable strings. There was that kind of the, the conflict within the community, especially the, uh, the people who had a very strong influence from Rails, so uh, easy, uh, easier to confuse uh, strings and symbols. And uh, there are uh, class names like a uh, Hash with uh, in uh, I don't I don't remember the name, but uh, the hash that uh, the yeah that one <laughs> yeah so I got the mountains of errors so I just gave up so in Ruby symbols and our strings I made up my my mind uh, symbols are identifiers but. Uh, that reminds me about identity. Actually, in Japanese, my language, we don't have the term identity. So it is quite a difficult concept for us to understand identity. But uh, so my thinking about me, my true identity, who, are, who am I, or who are you, really? is an identity. So who are you really? For me, I'm a programmer. I'm a hacker. A person who makes impossible possible. At least one I want to be like that. And, and a language designer. So and uh, by the way, how many language designers do you know? Me, Guido, Larry, or Rassens, or someone else, like a Joseph Varian for Elixir recently, and it, you. So I'm serious. You should be, a, you are, a language, uh, language designers. So I encourage you to design your own programming language. So I, maybe I confused you, but uh, so let me quote from this guy, the Dave Thomas. <laughs> Our Dave Thomas. <laughs> we have a lot of Dave Thomas out there. But uh, this Dave Thomas once said in a conference back then, so programming is a process of designing your own DSL. The programming is a process of designing your own DSL. So designing your library, designing your API, designing your framework, designing your user interface is kind of language. So because interface is a fundamentally a language, designing interface is a designing a language, designing API is a designing a language, designing framework is a designing a language. So they are languages between machine and man, humans. So we are language designers, seriously. The designing difficult task. There are a lot of pitfalls. So by designing languages, there are so difficult tasks. There's uh, actually tens of thousands of programming languages out there, the, in a narrow sense only. But uh, very few uh, programming language success. Just because there are so many pitfalls and traps in designing programming language. The, the biggest one is second system syndrome. Uh, second system syndrome, or SSS3 in short, is the, the time, as time goes by, systems will go bigger and more complex. And the program, uh, programmers or designers working on that system uh, getting sick of working on that kind of the complex system. So the, they are easy to create bugs, easy, hard to maintain. So the, 
you gradually become sick of maintaining that kind of complex system, grown-up system. The, the original system was uh, born small, simple, beautiful, and usable. But uh, as time grows, uh, goes by, the system gradually uh, creeping into the more complex monsters. So this is second system syndrome. So for most of the systems, especially long-living systems, the second system syndromes creeps in. So the second system, uh, we cannot uh, avoid meeting second system syndrome. So the, when you got sick of the maintaining the, that kind of the complex systems, you were tempted to throw away everything. So let's start scratch, from scratch. So let's uh, use that kind of knowledge, experience, so then recreate better things from scratch, from zero. So that would be very, very uh, attractive for developers. So creating a new system is very fun, attractive, amusing. So we, are, we will be very happy about the, uh, the second system, second better system, second more beautiful system. But uh, the most of the challenges will fail somehow. This is the true nature of second system syndrome. And then uh, implementing clearer, better system from scratch is far more difficult than we expect. That, and they fail. That happens all the time. That happens all the time. So especially for programming language, just because the programming language has uh, longer lifetimes comparing to uh, other ap applications. For example, so we have the, the, the oldest programming language named the Fortran, which still lives. It, it was born in, I don't know, 60 something years ago. And then the very old programming language like uh, COBOL and Lisp uh, still lives. So the, the programming languages uh, tend to have a long, long lifetime. So those kind of the long living system will suffer about the second system syndrome. The because language will live longer than for user application. So for example, the PAL5 is great programming language, but uh, they suffer about the second system syndrome. They throw away everything. They re redesigned better, cleaner, and monster language. And uh, they declared it will be released in this Christmas. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, last week, I attended the, the yet another power conference in Tokyo, and the Lally Wall was there. So he uh, proudly declares the release plan of the Pearl 6, finally, after 15 years of work. <laughs> Whoa, creating the, sec the great second system, now, not released publicly for 15 years. Whoa. And then, uh, really it's no exception. We had some kind of second system syndrome in some, some, uh, some degree. So we had uh, the, this conflict between the Ruby 1.8 versus Ruby 1.9. So in Ruby 1.9, we re-implement the virtual machine. We replace the virtual machine. And then we introduce the multilingualization, which can handle the multiple character encodings, Unicode, ShiftJS, EUC, or ISO something. So, Currently, Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 2.0, I mean, Ruby 2 handles more than 80 character encodings natively. So we introduced this kind of multilingualization, or M17N in short. So that introduced the compatibility gap. So you have to somehow, somewhat uh, tweak your program to run on one Ruby 1.9. So the, that took a long time to migrate. 
when, I re when we released the Ruby 1.9 in, I don't remember the year, but uh, the, since, since then, so we get the full 1.9 acceptance that took five, more than five years for just upgrading the one version, five years. But uh, is there anyone still using Ruby 1.8? Ah, uh, don't. <laughs> yeah, it's about time to move on. So yeah, we are open source. We have to keep moving forward. So we are, we are now in Ruby 2.2 era. So please move on. Ruby 1.8, it's slower. Actually, the, that virtual machine is implemented by me, myself, and uh, actually, I confess, I don't trust myself. <laughs> so Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 2 has much better virtual machine. Anyway, okay, we have done better than other languages. So we have done better to conquer to the, the second system syndrome. But how? And then how can we overcome second, syndrome, uh, second system syndrome? So we have three points. We have never thrown away everything. And then we had uh, some kind of version illusion, versioning illusion. And third, we have uh, some kind of the migration by bait. The, okay, let me uh, explain one by one. We have never thrown away everything. Despite we had a need to move on, to replace the virtual machine, to gain a more performance, or replace the object representation, or a need for the replacing the garbage collectors. We have many needs for the next system, the, modern, the second system. But uh, we have never thrown away everything, and uh, we never started from scratch. So we have replaced everything one by one. So we have replaced the string class for the better string object representation. And uh, we have replaced the virtual machine. So, and uh, we have replaced the object representation in general so that we can uh, have the, we, we consume less memory. And we have replaced the garbage collector. So in fact, the Ruby 1.9 is uh, the big step uh, forward, but still, we, it's a kind of the improvement of the previous systems. We haven't thrown away, threw away the Ruby 1.8. We just replaced one by one, part by part, to gain a more better performance. And then we try to keep compatibility as much as possible. We uh, prepare the test suites and they run test suite before and after the replacement. And uh, we have the, uh, the behavior change. We uh, rewrite the test, then write the, uh, the test for new spec and new behavior. So, and uh, we also prepare the migration path for new, uh, new features, like uh, the multilingualization. We have introduced uh, some kind of the magic comments to uh, specify the, the string encoding in your source file, or some kind, something like that. So we have never tried two drastic changes. So drastic change is very tempting. So the, the throw away everything, the, the implement, re-implement the neat, clear, small, nifty feature from scratch is very much tempting for programmers. But we have never tried that. So we uh, took step, uh, the improvement step by step. So the second is version illusion. Usually the, we have the, the Python 2 and the Python 3 sy syndrome, or Py, uh, Perl 5 and Perl 6 gap. But uh, we did some kind of the 1.8 and 1.9. That, that seems an uh, illusionary small step. That kind of the illusion is, is uh, for us, 
the, that helps conquer the, that kind of the migration gap or the second system syndrome gap. But, uh, st but still, it took five years. So for other languages, like a Perl 5 and Perl 6, it may take much longer than that, maybe. The, this is, the second one is not that important, though. And uh, the third part is migration byte. So, what? The moving 1.9 had a huge benefit for users. Just replacing uh, Ruby 1.9 makes your programs run twice or third, uh, three times faster just by replacing it. And then yeah, you have to pay some kind of the migration cost just because you know, the 1.8 and 1.9 was a little bit incompatible. incompatible. But a performance gain will, will be the huge motivation, motivation to move on. So for other systems, so the having cleaner inside, cleaner systems, or the easier to maintain system is no use for mere users. So they don't, have, they don't want to pay that kind of cost just, by, just to the follow the version upgrade. But uh, Ruby 1.9 had some kind of the huge bait. bait. So the, the performance, performance gain is a huge motivation for users. So the, from, um, I mean, in summary, <coughs> In summary, Ruby sum of the second system syndrome is uh, don't push too hard and push softly, <laughs> push steadily. So the compatibility is the key. So 2.0, which was uh, introduced uh, three, two years ago, I mean, two years ago, had almost perfect compatibility. So the, the last version of 1.9 was a 1.9.3, and then 1.9.3 and the, the Ruby version 2.0 had almost perfect compatibility. You can just uh, drop in replacement. You can use 2.0 as a drop in replacement, along with the uh, huge feature uh, enhancement. For example, the some kind of the aspect feature things on the, or the, some kind of the uh, refinements of the, the name scope bungling. But, uh, but still, the Ruby 2.0 works perfectly to run the system written for 1.9. But as time goes by, the second, second system syndrome comes again. So the there are some kind of the needs and the wants for Ruby 3.0. But uh, we don't forget the rules. Don't push too hard, push softly, and push steady. So we started working Ruby 3.0 last year. But, uh, but we started from experimenting first. By experiment, we had some very wild and crazy ideas, a lot of them, but uh, the, we experiment them one by one. Then after it turns, they turned, uh, turned out to work nicely, compatibil compatibility, com um, compatible, so we will introduce them in, in Ruby 3.0. So they are experiments. We don't promise anything for Ruby three point yet. So we we don't promise any plan, schedule, or the uh, the roadmap or anything. But uh, the the basic three basic concepts of the Ruby three point oh improvement is will be these three part: the man machine collaboration and performance and the concurrency. So the, the first one, the man machine collaboration means, so we code as the, uh, the communication between man and the machine from man to machine. We code. Then mach the machine reports back errors. 
as a compile error or runtime error. But uh, we recently we have the IDEs, in, uh, integrated uh, development environment, that uh, for the better communication between the programmers and the machines. But uh, we want to try something different. So we call it proactive warning. So for example, Ruby 3.1.3, uh, I mean, what Ruby 2.3, Ruby 2.3, which will be uh, released in the coming Christmas, this December, will have the, this dejuming feature. So if you kind of make, when you make some kind of the type, type mistake, typos, so the error message will uh, suggest the right name for the, your variable name, method name, or something. So, uh, like Google does. So did you mean something? You, you put the class name strings, but uh, did you mean string <laughs> or something like that? So we will have that in coming Ruby 2.3. But uh, that kind of enhancement will help programmer to write correct code in short amount of time. So the proactive or noisy warning will help us. So that will gradually introduce us uh, soft typing. The, the term soft typing is not gradual typing. Gradual typing is the, the optional typing, in other words. So, so as, say, the other language, like TypeScript, so that which has the any class, any type. But when you use any, it works as a dynamic type of programming language, like Ruby or Python or the plain JavaScript. But uh, the other part of the programming, lang programming so you declare the, the type of variables or the return values, so you will have the, some kind of the static typing. But uh, the, I don't like that. Just because, so by introducing the gradual typing, or the optional static typing. So you have to, to uh, the, the annotate the program uh, of, annotate the program. But uh, the, think about that. Your Ruby program runs without that kind of type of declaration. So why do we have to write down some kind of, that kind of redundant so it's kind of against the dry from my perspective. So don't repeat yourself. So uh, the don't, uh, dry principle avoid uh, duplicates and avoid redundancy. So avoid copying and paste uh, because it's bad. But type declarations are redundant, for Ruby at least. So, so I don't want to to force by the programming language to write down the, the types. So because Ruby runs without them, without type declaration. So we are lazy. I am lazy. We are too lazy to maintain, maintain duplicates. So the soft typing. Soft typing the static, the kind of static analysis. Everything, the whole program at once, and find a contradiction. This is not 100% correct uh, type checking. But uh, it helps you and this, uh, helps you find that, that kind of the, the type contradiction. So that would help you uh, fix bugs. So that kind of uh, typing we want to uh, in introduce to Ruby 3.0. Oh. Uh, but uh, we are very early stage of experiment. So I, again, we don't make any promise about soft typing. But I really, really wish we could have the, some kind of uh, assistant from compilers to write uh, correct programs. Third, uh, second, I mean, the performance. So the, the making Ruby faster is kind of difficult task, not easy. So the many people think about the JIT, just-in-time compiler, so the compiles everything into the native machine code 
at, at one time. But uh, from my ex our experiments, so we made some kind of the uh, JIT, JIT compiler for Ruby 2.0, uh, I mean, 2B2.2, I mean. So that system is in RuJIT. The, it is a tracing JIT for Ruby. So the Ruby Association, with the organization behind the, the helping maintenance, help, uh, help development Ruby, uh, Ruby the language, and uh, they gave uh, the grant to develop uh, this RuJIT. So then uh, we found out the, the using RuJIT, Ruby runs several times faster for many uh, benchmarks, many uh, mic micro benchmarks, I mean. But uh, it consumes a lot of log memory at the same time. For example, the, the tracing JIT compiles the trace. I, I cannot, I don't think I can explain correctly. Ask somebody. <laughs> Uh, the trace is the uh, execution path of the programs. So if uh, this short amount of code, the trace branches at the loop or the kind of conditional statement. So the, the trace in JIT, when trace in JIT saw, see the, the conditional statement, so the Tracing JIT compiles two separate uh, machine instructions for the true, true conditions and false conditions, that kind of things. So for, because of that kind of the tracing, so tracing, uh, the JIT, tracing JIT compiles a lot, a lot of traces and it consumes a lot of memory. But uh, bad part is the recently we were very easy to see memory bottleneck. And uh, the, uh, I work for the company named Heroku. <laughs> and uh, it is the, 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 un the execution unit named Dino. And the smallest Heroku Dino has only has 520K, uh, 20 meg of memory, which is very easy to, to meet in the Rails applications. So when we uh, introduce, uh, if we introduce uh, that, that kind of trace JIT, we are the Ruby with JIT will not run on this small dinos. That was very terrible for many users. Uh, maybe good for Heroku, the company. <laughs> you have to pay. <laughs> But the, you know, the, it's not good news for Heroku users. So we gave up that kind of tracing JIT. So we will try the, the alternative of comp the JIT compile method, ma named the method JIT. Actually, the, the few, few, weeks few weeks ago, the IBM offered their, the JIT technology for Ruby. So, but I haven't talked with him yet. So. I, I, don't, I don't know yet what their intention or what technology they are going to offer, but we very welcome about their offer. So I wish we could do anything better to make Ruby faster for Ruby 3.0 or earlier. And the concurrency, the big issue. So the, when I started uh, designing Ruby in 20 years ago, actually 22 years ago, so the computers has only a s one CPU for computers. So we don't have to worry about the multi-core. But uh, these days, we have dual-core, quad-core, octa-core, or even more cores in the computer. So we have to utilize these cores. So we really, really need for concurrency. But uh, we have something named JIT, JL, in our Ruby uh, virtual machine. Uh, JL stands for the global interpreter lock, which is the, the, to protect the program or the portion of the program or C libraries, which are not thread safe. So the Ruby users see 
uh, one, one Ruby thread uh, at a time for CPU intensive work. So Ruby used the multi-core uh, uh, for the I.O. intensive works, just uh, ask operating system or system calls for, to run, then the, we do the other things. But for CPU intensive work, so global interpreter arc hinders the performance. So many people want to remove that jail. So I once tried to uh, prepare the, the compile option to remove jail. And then, but I didn't do that. <laughs> Just because no, by you will see uh, how many programs will crash without global interpreter lock. But uh, I, I wasn't too mean <laughs> to protect you. OK, but uh, we have several things. We have some kind of native threads for IO intensive work. And the JRuby and the Rubinius are thread safe, uh, relatively better. Uh, and then we have event machines and cool IO for the event driven programming. And uh, we are still working on concurrency. But uh, concurrency is heard. Uh, thread safety is very, very difficult. Uh, thread is too complex. Uh, concurrency itself, in nature, is very complex. So remember, this conference started 30 minutes uh, later, late. But uh, we had a concurrency problem <laughs> at the, the reception desk. You know that? We have long lines of queue. And we have the resource sharing, deadlocks, everything. <laughs> the concurrency is hard in nature. So we need for more abstract concurrency models. So we, when we have a fine grade uh, concurrency control, so we have better performance, uh, possibly. But uh, we are very easy to make mistake. Uh, make uh, make sense and bad. So, so more abstract concurrency models will uh, have the less performance, but uh, much cleaner and less error prone. So my big plan for Ruby uh, G Ruby Gel is one add more abstract concurrency. For example, actors and add warning when you use this thread directory, then remove jail. This is my plan for Ruby 3.0. And then uh, what is our the better concurrency model? So we have several ideas. For example, the actors, like Elixir does, or Erlon does, or some other programming language does, I like Go. Or some kind of ownership models. So ownership models is kind of like uh, the memory uh, management model of the language named Rust. But uh, we apply that kind of similar model for uh, concurrency. So one object, uh, one, I mean, one thread owns the object. So only the threads that own the object can modify the object. So the other object can look, can look at the, to, to refer the object, to, to look at the object, but that they cannot change your value. So you don't have to worry about the, what? Uh, the, the locking, so modification, and the, the gradual deadlock from those kind of the, the data sharing. And the other idea is a stream or pipeline model, like a, the plain old shell does. So today, I will introduce about the, the last one, the stream model. The stream model is a pretty simple model, and uh, it doesn't cover 100% of concurrency. But uh, when it works, it works pretty well. So this is the, uh, the future Ruby concurrency programming. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an El Elixir pipeline uh, operator, but it is different. OK, uh, standard in pipes into the standard out. This, this is the statement to prepare some kind of stream or pipeline. 
from standard in to standard out. That works just like a CAD program. Read standard in, then write standard out. Uh, this is the very easy uh, echo server of the socket echo server. They create socket, then the connector pipeline to the map, then receive the socket, client socket, then connect the input from the client socket, reverse back to the same socket. This is the simple echo server. This is the, the next example is the simple netcat. So the read the, the lines of, read, the, read a line from standard in, then send it to the, uh, the network socket, then receive the output from the network socket. So, unlike shell programming, these the pipeline operators just prepare the pipeline. It it doesn't run at this this point. So the we will, for, in my idea, I, we don't pro make promise anything, but we will introduce the new operator, the new pipeline operator, then that creates pipeline. Then. The, the, at the end of the program, we will, the, the program, the virtual machine, will enter the event loop. So, that, 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 okay, simple cat one. Okay, this program creates the pipeline. The, at the end of the program, the next line, the Ruby virtual machine will enter into the, 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 the event loop. Then we, the event loop, read the input from standard in to standard out. Then when the input is closed, the gradually event loop will finish. This is simple CAD program. So in that way, the normal Ruby program, the program will be, programs will be structured like this. The normal Ruby that creates the pipelines Pipelines. <laughs> I made a mistake. Okay, and uh, the, then the program will enter into the thread-safe event-driven loop. So it's kind of like a loop Goldberg programming. So prepare the pipelines, then throw the balls into the pipeline, or maybe the, the dominoes, the re, uh, line the dominoes. They, they, at the end of the programs, event loop just push the domino. The, the event loop will be thread safe. Just because you know, uh, in the, the event loop mode, the every object, in my, in, in my idea, every object will be immutable. So we, uh, the, the program will not uh, modify the object. So we don't have to worry about the sharing. And then we will have the, uh, the object immutability in thread mode. So that we don't have to worry about that. And then we ha have some kind of experimental language named stream which here, which is the, some kind of the Ruby-like programming language. To the, as a proof of con concept of this programming model. It, it doesn't work well yet. <laughs> it's just a toy programming language, but uh, it's just a proof of, uh, uh, the proof of concept of uh, this stream model in programming. And uh, it seems works well, I hope. And uh, yeah, you can check out this, this repository afterwards. Anyway, so again, we are still experimenting a lot of wild and crazy ideas, and we will be very open-minded. So if you have great idea for new Ruby, and, uh, or the, the great idea to improve the community, or improve the language, and improve the uh, future, so please let us know about that, and write the feature request. But remember, we will not throw away everything in future. So we will keep compatibility 
So when you write your feature request, please uh, keep, in mind, keep it in, mind, in your mind. So we make no promise about the Ruby, uh, future of Ruby. We will announce any roadmap. But uh, let us talk about Ruby 3.0. So to make some kind of a gradual step to create better future while keeping compatibility. So happy hacking. Thank you. <laughs>